kids? Welcome to the Peabody Museum of Natural History. Now, in no one's class, we've all been learning about plant genetics and reproduction. And I was so excited to take you all on a tour of Yale's greenhouse, but it looks like they're under construction for the day. Ah, I was so looking forward to this field trip. Me too. Yeah. I'm so sad. This field trip is wrong. And don't worry, it's not that serious. Luckily, Mr. Chris Bush has another way of getting inside. Ah! receptacle of the flower. I love popsicles. Um, no. The receptacle is the part of the flower stalk where floral organs are attached. As we move up the receptacle, we see floral organs such as the sepals, petals, stamens, and pistils. This is the sepal, the outer part of the flower, usually green and leaf-like, that encompasses the developing bud. These are the petals, the parts of the flower that are often colored. And if you look straight ahead, you'll see the stamen, the pollen-producing part of the flower. The stamen consists of a filament and anther, and the anther is the part of the flower where pollen is actually produced. Kids, we are now standing on top of the pistil, where pollen germinates. A pistil is the ovule-producing part of the flower. The ovary often supports a long style topped by a stigma. The mature ovary is the fruit, while the mature ovule is the seed. Then there's the ovary, the enlarged basal portion of the pistil, where ovules are produced. It's just a bumblebee. What is it doing? It's pollinating that flower. Huh? Pollination is the process in which plants reproduce. The pollen that develops from the stamen, the male reproductive organ of the flower, is transferred over to the stigma, the female reproductive organ, of a second flower. When bees collect nectar from flowers, the pollen sticks to the tiny hairs all over their body, and when they go to the second flower, it's released. This second flower becomes fertilized and develops a fruit which is a ripened ovary with seeds that can develop into new flowers. Mr. F, if the seeds are inside the fruit, then how does it come out to go into a plant? That happens through a process known as seed dispersion. There's many ways that seeds can be dispersed. Some seeds use the power of the wind to travel hundreds of yards. This is used by seeds such as whirlybirds and dandelions. Plants are also able to use the power of animals in order to disperse their seeds. They put the seeds in colorful, delicious fruits, which are then eaten by the creatures. The animals then travel long distances, with the seeds in their stomachs. And eventually, nature calls. And they know when their hotline bling, it can only mean one thing. They got a poop. So eventually they relieve themselves, and seeds pass through their body and make their way to a sustainable plot of land, which are then able to grow into plants. Other plants are able to disperse their seeds independently, like pea plants. When they're ripe, they're able to explode and release their seeds without any help from an outside source. Um, Mr. Frizzle? Yes? A lot of these flowers are really unique. Some are spotted, some have solid colors, and others look like they have a mix between two colors. Why are they all so different? That's because of a concept known as Mendel's genetics. M Mendel's genetics? God, you ask a lot of questions. Anyway, Mendel was a German physicist who liked to study the hereditary traits of plants. He worked by breeding garden peas in a process known as hybridization. He would then study the offspring that develop in each generation, and review their characteristics. 
So that's kind of like how we inherit traits from our parents. Aha! I was an accident. Moving on, say we transfer the pollen from a white flower onto a red flower. We may see that all the offspring that develops are all red flowers. Why is that? Um, is it because the white flower tree is recessive? You're right! Can you explain? Um, let Phoebe do it. In sexual reproduction, we have alleles from both our mothers and our fathers. Two of these genes will express a trait. If the allele is dominant, it will always be expressed. If the allele is recessive, it will have to come in pairs to be expressed. So what if there are two dominant traits? Does that mean they're both expressed? Correct! So if a red and a white trait were to combine, that must explain why some flowers are mixed. That's called co-dominance. In other times, the colors fuse together, like in pink flowers, which is incomplete dominance. I still don't get it, though. You don't get a lot of things, Carlos. <laughs> We could do a Punnett square! That's a great idea! What are Punnett squares? Punnett squares are used to visually demonstrate the predicted allele compositions of offspring. If the alleles of two parents are known, we can predict all of the possible allele combinations that their offspring may have. Let's see if Phoebe can show Carlos. Okay, so this is a Punnett square. So say that capital T represents tall prints and lowercase t represents short prints. If parent 1 is heterozygous dominant for tall, <coughs> and parent 2 is homozygous recessive for short, then these are the possible genotype and phenotype of the offspring. There will be a 50% chance that the offspring will be tall, and 50% chance that the offspring will be short. A dihybrid cross is a Punnett square that studies two traits rather than one. Say we study tall and short traits, and red and white traits. Capital T would represent tall, lowercase t would represent short. Capital R would represent red, and lowercase r would represent white. If we distributed all of these alleles, we would see an offspring percentage as this. There would be nine tall reds, three tall whites, three short reds, and one short white. Ah! Okay class, let's review what we learned today. Well, today we talked about the anatomy of a reproductive flower and the role they play in the functioning of a flower. We also learned how seeds are developed and how they're dispersed in order to create a new generation of plants. Then we learned about mental genetics and how different traits are expressed according to dominant and recessive alleles. Great job, class! We really learned a lot today. What was your favorite part of the trip? I like that part too. Well, thanks for coming with us on our trip to the Peabody Museum of Natural History. We'll see you next time. Bye! Bye. Synthesis. Let's get into this discussion of sunlight and transfer of energy. Photosynthesis. Let's get into this process of chemical yeah. reaction. Plants take water, sun, and CO2 to make glucose, the sugar that they use for food. They also put oxygen into the air so we can share because oxygen is everywhere. The energy transfer from solar to chemical. All the time, <laughs> The thylakoid okay. membrane is where it happens ATP and NADPH are products of light, water, air, and space Photosynthesis, let's get into this discussion of sunlight and transfer of energy Let's get into this process of chemical reactions Photosynthesis, let's get into this discussion of sunlight <laughs>